boom, we're in this space that I can only describe as the cosmos. There was darkness, but there was immense light. And then colors that I have never seen in this incarnation. And as I come into it, I feel what I never felt in my human incarnation, which was held. And I mean held in a way that makes you feel so safe, so loved, so cared for. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Thank you so much for joining us today, wherever you are in the world right now. I'm Louise, your host, and I'm so excited about our guest today, Brooke Grove. Brooke Grove had a near-death experience when systemic organ failure of the lungs, liver, and kidneys resulted in a comatose state and death. Brooke is an intuitive guide, integrative healer, specializing in mind, body, psychology, shamanic energy medicine, vibrational alignment and embodiment coaching. This is her story and this is her passion. Brooke Grove, welcome to Passion Harvest. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm likewise honored to be here. It was so interesting trying to get this interview. I'll just tell the audience that you often said after your near-death experience, you can affect technology. And it took us quite a few minutes to um, try and get some internet bandwidth speed, which has never happened before. This is fascinating. I'd love to hear about your after effects later, but if you don't mind um, talking to the audience about the events or your near-death experience, and what happened and... Of course. So it was 10 years ago, I was 29 years old, and I had been experiencing autoimmunity since I was in my dual MA, which I began at 23. And initially, everyone thought that I had a certain type of autoimmunity, and I went through gamuts of doctors, but they can never come to a consistent consensus regarding what was causing the disease. Intuitively, even prior to the NDE itself, I had always been an empath or highly sensitive person. And so I had this gut feeling, very visceral gut feeling that my past was informing my physical illness. Yet at the time we were in a different paradigm as far as research on trauma. And I am a poly trauma survivor. And it occurred when I was very young and continued all the way up until I left the East Coast to get away from it. That said, there wasn't research at that time on how trauma can manifest into physical disease. That barrier has shifted dramatically mm -hmm. in the past decade. And so I was going to all these doctors and I really wanted to say to them, I feel like I've embodied all of these things that happen and it's throwing the physical human off. But at the same time, I didn't feel comfortable enough to say that. And so the doctor's responses were that I was taking 20 credits, you're doing two MAs, you're just stressed out. And that's what's causing all this illness. Well, it would ebb and flow for years. And then when I was going for my PhD, it got to a point where I was bedridden by it. Joints locking, swelling. Um, I was having lung failure at that point. I would get like pneumonia and bronchitis and it would last for like all of fall into the winter. So I needed equipment to breathe. I was starting to have severe back pain. They realized the kidneys were involved. And yet that intuition just kept talking louder. And so being a researcher at the time myself, I looked into where else can I get answers? And it turned out that John Hopkins, which is in Maryland, where I'm originally from, has the world's leading autoimmune research center, or at least they did at that time. And so I got myself in, it was a very long wait 
because everyone is trying to get in there. But because of the complexity of the case and how many diagnoses I've been given and how rapidly my body was beginning to fail and my age, they took me in pretty fast. That said, my near-death experience occurs before I can even get to Hopkins. I fly east and I'm staying at my family's home. And I end up having what is the absolute worst, most debilitating flare of my life. And I reach out to all the professionals back in Los Angeles that have been treating me. And they advise me to take the medications as directed and just stay in bed until I can get to Hopkins and that everything's going to be okay. Just take your medicine. And at this point, it's a rheumatologist, a pulmonologist, critical care pulmonologist, um, my kidney doctor, and I want to ask, is there anything, pain management as well. So all of those doctors I've reached out to. And so I do exactly what they say. I take the medication and I get in bed. That's really all I remember prior to going into coma. Now, I didn't go right into coma and right into my NDE. My family actually comes home by the grace of spirit. They come home and they see me in bed and I'm swollen probably 15 to 20 pounds, which is what the liver does when it fails rapidly. And I'm purple, head to toe, jaundice, just, it just covered in bruises. You know, they have no idea what's happened. They're terrified. They actually think I'm dead because I'm not responding. I'm face down and very shallow breathing. They realize I am conscious. So they immediately get hospital care and I'm taken to a local ER. And from that local ER, I was so critical that they flew me to Hopkins. So on the flight or before the flight, I'm not exactly sure. I've heard it different from my family, but my medical records suggest it happened prior to going onto the, the helicopter. They hear me wailing in pain. So what do they do when you're wailing in pain and you look as horrid as I did in that state? They want to help ease the pain. And so they give me a shot of morphine. Now, what no one understands at this time is that the liver has been failing for months. And so the medications that I was told to take to help actually ended up shutting down my liver. And it shut it down so rapidly that it took all the other weak organs with it. So it was liver, lungs, kidneys, and then coma. So my NDE begins as I ascend from the human and in ICU as they're desperately attempting to save my life. And I remember feeling as if it was a lucid dream. I was looking down at the body, but I didn't recognize it. It was so so swollen and so purple and so yellow. And so I think I'm having a dream. And I didn't really like this dream. So I'm trying to wake myself up. And that's when I realize I'm being pulled like a magnet up, 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 up. And I have absolutely zero control. This is not a lucid dream. What's striking, and you hear this in so many NDE accounts, is that although I was fully separate from my body, I was still fully myself. Like my consciousness was very much me. There was still, yes, Brooke. There was still this playfulness. There was curiosity. There were all the things that I embody in my human were there in my consciousness. And yet the consciousness was just this free floating orb that at, you know, it was like, being everything and nothing at all, like I was still myself, yet I was starting to begin to connect to all of these other light beings. And it was a very rapid shift. Like, here we go from the hospital, up, 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 and then boom, we're in this space that I can only describe 
as the cosmos. There was darkness, but there was immense light. And in colors that I have never seen in this incarnation, there is no filter, no level of saturation that you could take something to that is parallel to the beauty of this space. And as I come into it, I feel what I never felt in my human incarnation, which was held. And I mean held in a way that makes you feel so safe, so loved, so cared for. There, there are, there's absolutely, I mean, as you always hear with NDEs, it's ineffable. There really is, there are no words. And so it was held. And I remember just feeling that that was so delicious and so yummy. And I never wanted to let go of that feeling. And as I was just being held by all of these different types of lights and vibrations, a set, a trio of lights came forward. And these lights I recognized. And I had known them since my childhood. And it was such a beautiful reunion because there was this awareness that I was in a different space, yet I was still me. And they communicate their telepathy or inner knowing. And so they confirmed to me that, yes, we've been with you on this journey and countless others. And you're separated from the body, yet for me, I was able to retain some of my memory, some of my, you know, awareness. So it was kind of like being, going through a quantum experience of this incarnation, wherein, yes, they did appear to me as a child. Yes, they were very real. Yes, I shared this with my family and it wasn't welcome. I grew up very religious. So of course it was difficult for them to accept that I was saying I was seeing angels, but they appear as light, (laughs) not winged beings. (laughs) So in this space, these beautiful angelics, they just really held me for a long time. And as they did, I began to feel the pool of my light, my orb to the light, the light that compared to no others. This was the source light or the God light (laughs) or the one. It was just a knowing, knowing. Yes, there's just a knowing. Yes. And this light, its communication, its inner knowing was a welcoming. It was a return. It was saying to me that I was of it that I was from it and that I had permission to reunify with it if I chose to. And honestly, the angelics were communicating more like, because I was kind of in awe and do I want to go and, you know, just so much beauty. Like I had known so much trauma in in my incarnation. And then all of a sudden, I'm just surrounded by nothing but love and beauty and safety. And I'm curious about everything. And yet I trust that no matter what happens all is well. And they were communicating that too. The angelics were very much giving me more insight because I would have, I I suppose you would say it's it's hard to put into words because we're communicating again through that Mm -hmm. inner knowing um, or light, literally the vibrations of the light would shift. And when they would shift, you knew. And so- They were sharing information with you in whatever capacity that was. Exactly. And so I- they felt in some ways my hesitancy to reunify and yet I was mesmerized and they normalized that, that, and, and acknowledged that I was in an in-between state 
that I had the freedom to choose to go into that light and become one with it, that we are all fractals of this source. Or I could choose to go back to the human and it might not be the easiest return. They say it far more lovingly than our language allows. But there was a knowing that the return meant I was going to go back to more difficulty, at least initially. But they did communicate that my soul had chosen much of the challenges because of where it was all going to go, what I was going to alchemize from said challenges. And at the same time, there was the awareness and the sharing that if I went into the light, all is well, yet eventually I would choose to come back and many of those same stories would, would manifest, would have to be replayed. Or I can come back and finish it now. To the parts of me that were still very human-like in this consciousness, mm -hmm. the idea of coming back to more trauma was utterly terrifying. And even in that beautiful space, there I felt that fear, except they held it. And the minute that they held it, it dissolved. And they showed me pictures, like, again, just like flashes of information. And at the time, absolutely none of it made sense upon returning. Uh, now, every day, it's like I get more and more understanding of what they showed me. And the message is they felt me start to like kind of pull back a little bit from the source light and consider with curiosity, compassion, passionate curiosity returning to the human body, they made it known that should I come back and do the work, the hard and holy work that was ahead of me, I would come into a time. And again, they're communicating through vibrations, mm -hmm. lights, and inner knowing. And it was communicated to me the number 10. I had no idea what they meant by 10. Okay, now it's 2010 when this occurs. And 10 years later, in 2020, much of this starts to make sense. Wow. But the number 10 was very significant in a multitude of ways. So for one, they introduced me to two other light beings while I was there. Now, these were not angelics. They were how I see auras now. Yet the, they made it very clear to me that these two lights were important in this particular story, should I go back? And again, they, they allowed for my curiosity. They engaged it. And so I spent time with these particular lights, one of which was just the purest, most beautiful indigo I have ever seen. The other was this beautiful green. And there was something about those two that really reminded my soul that I wasn't going to be alone in this, not just in the 10 and whatever that meant, because again, I didn't know, but that coming back to the body, there were, there were other guides and there were going to be other lights in this incarnation to assist me. And so I sat in that space for a very, what seemed like years. I was comatose three and a half days. However, when I woke, I very much believed it had been three and a half years Gosh. because there's no time there. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just, you're kind of, things are moving at the speed of light. You're being communicated multitudes of messages that are beyond you know, even our highest consciousness fully being able to understand at that time. And you feel safe. So I just stayed in that safety, really enveloping it and embodying it without a body, but really allowing my soul to just be nourished 
by this feeling that I honestly do not know I ever experienced in this incarnation because the trauma became began so young. And because I always felt um, as an outsider, you know, now I would say the rainbow sheep, but as a child, the black sheep of the family, being highly intuitive and uh, gifted and, and, you know, not kind of always being an outlier and being able to read people when I was very young and being punished for it. So there that wasn't the case. So I just swam in the, the beauty of being held and loved unconditionally for as long as I could. And then the intensity of the light began to really shift, almost as if there was a cosmic storm occurring in the space. And I could feel that the time for me to stay or go was upon us. And I felt a call to the human, which surprised even my soul. What a decision. And so I asked them, how do I get back? And it's difficult to explain because again, it's it's a big one, right? I didn't, you're kind of like, in the quantum field, which is what this was very much, you're seeing all these different timelines, you're seeing all these things co-occurring. I could see all around me, it was as if there was no direction, and yet I didn't know how to get back to the body, to the human. And there was still this, this tiny sliver that wanted to go to the, to the light, because of course, who wants to give up this feeling of unconditional love and peace and all of that? Yet there was a firm anchoring back to the body as if the body was saying, come back, please come back. You have to come now. And so they told me to look for the light unlike any other. Now they had shown me the auric lights. There was the beautiful, indescribable source light. And then there was their beautiful, highly hued, jewel toned angelic colors. As soon as I looked for a light unlike any others, I was literally blinded, just as I am today, by most artificial lights. <laughs> so you'll see me squinting a lot. Um, I was blinded by this piercing light and I was catapulted back into the human. And literally, as I open my eyes, the first thing I see in the left eye, which was the first I was able to open, is a flashlight. And it was a neurological flashlight. They were checking my vitals, um, trying to see any activity. And so I am catapulted from the most beautiful, sacred, magical, mysterious place back into a body that I don't know. I don't recognize it. They've taken my glasses and, well, my contacts, and I have no glasses. And so the first thing I see is this body, and I, I almost feel like I've been put in the wrong body because this body is strapped down to a bed. It's at least 30 pounds heavier than I recall my body being. And so when I come back into analytical brook, human brook, I am like, what's going on? What happened? Oh, that was a wild dream you know, kind of thing. But what is this body? Am I still dreaming? Wake me up. Because the body strapped down. I didn't understand at the time I'd been declared brain dead, probably brain dead. Very, very likely oh, is what they told my family. There was very minimal activity on the brain um, monitors. Additionally, yeah, it was tough. Additionally, my Glasgow scale, which is how they um, scale comas, I was in the very, very low percent of recovery. So it was predicted that had I woken with, I would be in a vegetative state. And so I have a pick line going into my brain and that's part of why I'm strapped down because the slightest movement would alter that pick line. And that was the only hope my family and the medical doctors believed what I had for a physical recovery. Additionally, I'm intubated because I've been comatose for three and a half days and I can't breathe on my own from the lung failure. 
So I, there's this, this strong and discombobulating juxtaposition of where I was, all of the magic, all the beauty, and then surrendering back into this incarnation. It, it literally felt like I had been dropped from heaven into hell. And not being able to communicate that I was in there when there were staff all around me, but nobody could tell I was there. I could not move. The only control I had was to move my left fingers and my left eye. And so I sit with this a while and I'm processing what's happened, yet not knowing how I got into this place. And the science-oriented aspects of myself are challenging everything I just experienced in the cosmos or the heavens. And I begin to panic a bit. And uh, intuitively, I try to calm myself down because that's what I was trained to do as a therapist and a psychologist. And there's this other part that's like, no, no, panic. Shift your vitals. They might notice. So I literally just allow myself to just get as scared and let it all out, release it, release, release. And as I release this, my vitals shoot up on all of their machinery. And that's when I just started rapidly blinking and moving my fingers as hard as I could. And a nurse noticed. And she said, I believe she's trying to communicate. And so she came back over with that horrible flashlight and put it back in my eye and I noticed right away why are lights so different like I just could not tolerate artificial lights and this again is without my contacts or glasses and she takes the flashlight away and she says to me blink once for yes two for no and we start communicating through the one eye I can move and at that point the angelics resurface. They come into the room. Yeah, it was. They knew I was doubting. They knew I was struggling. They knew I needed to be held again, but here. And the minute that they came, I felt so much peace. Even though I still did not know what had happened to me. I still had not seen my family. I still couldn't talk or move, but I was surrounded. Moreover, they were here in this realm. Now, <laughs> at first it was very, very comforting, but then it all starts to multiply very rapidly, the after effects. As I start to notice that doctors and nurses who are coming in to speak with me, suddenly I see something around all of them and it's always moving and it's, it's different colors and different hues and there's like spots on some people and not on others. Some people I was seeing organs that were really dark and I could tell they were sick and I could feel it on my own when I would touch them, the ones that had failed. And I was like, what is going on? What am I seeing? I start then to really worry, you know, has some, have they given me drugs? How am, am I hallucinating? And finally, now mind you, I cannot speak for three days because it takes them three days to take the intubator out. So because I could move my left hand, I did eventually get someone to bring me paper and pen so that I could ask, what happened <laughs> and begin to get some clarity and some answers. And as I began to receive from the humans and from the hospital and from the doctors, what had happened to my body, spirit began to show me, yes, you are Brooke, yet you are not Brooke as you knew her before. There were so many psychic, intuitive, unfoldments that were happening very, very rapidly. And the, the first that I could really notice was just the amount of light coming out of my hands. And it was just happenstance that I would put it on like the liver because it hurt 
and they couldn't give me any medication because I had had complete liver failure. So my thesis that the drugs might have been causing this was not true as I had not been able to take anything since they had shot me with the morphine in mm -hmm. the um, helicopter prior. And so I was on absolutely nothing. And yet all of these things are starting to unfold. And I would notice that when I called on the angelics, because I would ask them to come when I would get scared, that the light would intensify in my hands, that the amount of energy I could feel giving to myself and the organs would quantify as an understatement. And then at nighttime, because it was the time that I was the most alone in the hospital, I would play with these newfound gifts. And that's when I noticed, you know, ICU is all glass. And so glass walls, that is. And so I would notice that every time they yelled code blue or code red, I would int intuitively be guided to look at the rooms if they were nearby. And even if they weren't nearby, I could feel what was occurring in there. But what I could see, that was what was mind blowing. I would see if someone was choosing to transition and go into the light, I would see this like crystalline pillar form around them. And then suddenly the presence of angelic, sometimes they were actually beloveds or late ancestors, they would appear. And if the person chose to go into the light, they would all be just taken right up. And I, I mean, I must have been in my hospital bed like this, <laughs> you know, what, what watching all of this wow. because it was just like, yeah, it was just, it was wild. It was so wild. And so I had been told in the hospital that I would spend years in recovery. I would be in a wheelchair and I needed to go on the liver transplant list immediately. There were no chances that I was going to fully recover. Every time the doctors walked in, it was some dire news. And yet every time in their field, I would see spirit would show me more information about them than what they were saying. Almost as if there was a meta message, just ignore everything coming out of their mouth. <laughs> and focus on what you can see, feel, and now, you know, the six senses and beyond are awake. Well, I worked with those hands of light in the hospital and I was able, they had told me I'd been in there for, I don't know how long, but for a very long time, I was basically going to be dropped from ICU to a lower level of care, then go to a rehabilitation hospital and just wait years and years for my transplant. Well, using the hands of light intuitively prior to any training with the shamanic um, teams or any, any energy medicine of any modality, I used the hands of light and the assistance of the angels and the archangels. And my coma occurred on the 6th through the 9th of December. And by the 21st, right before Christmas, I had already been dropped to a lower level of care practicing getting in and out of bed without permission when they didn't know at night and working to heal my organs. And so while they're still frenetically attempting to diagnose me and figure out what went wrong, they've now acknowledged it's some sort of medical error and something obviously is quite wrong. It was Tylenol that actually shut down the liver and it was not the type of amounts of Tylenol you would think would cause liver failure. But because the liver was already compromised, it was too weak to process the Tylenol that was in benign amounts in multiple medications, okay? Yeah. Uh, the same medicines all the doctors insisted were safe to take together, okay? And from their opinion, it, it should have been. If they, had, if they had known about my liver, they wouldn't have told me to take that medication. Okay, so it was medical error, but I, there was no ill intention or maladaptive intention. I've got a couple of questions to ask you, if you don't mind. Um, I guess the first. Per Go for it. <laughs> um, I guess the first one is you talk about source or the light when you were having your near death experience, and you did a great job of describing. How would you describe? And I know it was a feeling experience. How would you describe source? <sighs> I 
when I feel into it now, I'm a naturally cold person. I have a blanket on my lap right now <laughs> with the AC. When I feel into that light, it literally warms like the sun. And yet it doesn't burn. It's not too hot. It's almost as if being enveloped in a blanket that just automatically mirrors and resonates exactly what you need. And one of the most breathtaking aspects is when you're in that energy or, or calling in that light, you feel that beautiful thread that connects you to it. So you know it's part of you, that, the, that there truly is a God or goddess within and that we're always anchored to it but just that divine remembrance of that thread because with that you can feel here and now that same love that same holding that same safety that same non-judgmental capacity that only the creator of all that is sees gives. And yet, because we're all anchored to said creator, we can give that to. It's such, I mean, beyond words, but such a gift. Well, you did a beautiful job. Thank you. And I just wanted to also add that anyone has access to that light. We are part of that light. Exactly. You talk about the gifts that you came back with. Do you mind um, speaking about what those gifts were? Yes. Um, I didn't understand at the time, but the interwoven light that I was seeing was my ability to access the quantum field. So I was seeing, you know, seeing the energy field of both living things, inanimate objects, and I was especially sensitive to electronics, which is why I'm sitting far back. And which is why, our, by the way, if, if I have to replay this, but our video keeps going slow and shorting. I'm sure it is. It's never happened like this before. You no, no, that's no, fine. You, you can ask PMH because I know she's as sensitive as I am. Um, there's, there's, there's varying levels of the degrees that electronics seem to um, improve impact some people. Now she's had three NDEs. I had a very close call. I would call it more of a spiritually transformative experience in my teen years, but I was close to death, not a full-blown NDE. However, I was in it with the light three and a half days. And I have tons and tons of friends within the NDE community. And I've yet to meet anyone other than PMH who's as sensitive to electronics as I am. And so it's, uh, it, that's, that's one of the things. So it's, it's, you know, and for persons, some people really struggle to believe this until they see it, but after they witness it a few times, they're like, oh my gosh, um, just bright lights in general, because I, it's not that I'm just seeing the light that it's emitting. I'm seeing all the frequencies and vibrations and, you know, all the energies that are going into that light. So it becomes very blinding. And so electronics are difficult, especially artificial lights. I see auras. I have learned to cloak people because I don't always want to see what's going on mm -hmm. in the quantum field and on their person. Now, the way I had understood auras when prior to my NDE was that people had an, an aura color. That's how I'd always received it. Right. Yet that couldn't be more wrong for how it's revealed to me. Yes, persons have a baseline color, but because we're always feeling, we are always in all of our senses, they're constantly moving. And right. then at the top of that, the quantum field, and it's just kind of, you know, I've used this comparison a lot lately because the only other way I know how to really give it to people is to draw it myself. But if you know the artwork of Alex Gray, if you took his artwork, which shows all of these layers and all of these colors, if you took it and you animated it at a really high speed, that's what I was seeing. 
Wow. And so that was, you know, until I learned to ground and cloak, that was, that was intense. It was much more intense than any psychedelic or plant medicine I had experienced prior to my NDE. Um, you know, I know plant medicine is very popular for healing trauma right now. I myself have participated in research as an observer. I would never want to take anything like that for, for myself. No judgment upon others. Mm -hmm. But I constantly see that kind of stuff and receive that kind of information. Well, you don't need, you don't need to take it, do you? Exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I don't want anything to do with that because it's all on all the time for me. So I the aura is big deal oh, go ahead. no sorry i just want to ask for those of you that don't know or just to explain it what do you mean by the quantum field what does it look like and what is it what it is is it's really co-occurring timelines so if i'm working with someone in session let's say and i am given direct permission from both the human and the spirit to do certain work i'm able to see and I work from a distance internationally, but I'm able to see on the quantum grid that I create for them, uh, which is co-created by spirit. I'm able to actually tap into and see, okay, here's the human now, here's the human in this past life that's making this human sick, or here's an ancestor. It's all right there. Like you can jump timelines within the quantum because it's co-occurring. We, want to believe that physical matter what's happening here right now is the only true lived authentic experience and yet quantum physics is continually proving more and more that there is a multiverse that things are occurring faster than you could ever imagine and things like time travel and whatnot are very likely probable because everything is coexisting it's kind of like a layer cake if you think of a layer cake and but a big one with all this different icing going through it that icing is veiled to most people so they're only in the piece of the cake that they know that they have embodied that they call reality but truthfully they are part of a really big piece of cake and once you move away that icing, which is what spirit did for me, you're able to see all of the multi dimensions within the person, within the chakras, because chakras spin in two directions and sometimes more. And they also go across all layers, all timelines and dimensions. So quite often a person can be dealing with something that's making them ill in the subtle bodies, whether it's the etheric, the spiritual, the mental, the emotional, or the physical. And it might be something that has been stored in the chakra from a former lifetime or from, you know, some ancestral programming that no one has, till them has had the courage to step up and break. So it's fascinating because the quantum allows you not to just see energy or just see auras, but to actually integrate the auric activity and what's happening to the physical person, how they're presenting in the moment, in addition to how they're presenting across all time and space. All this work is experiential. Did you ever doubt yourself that you're just making this up? And for many of those that may be listening and do a lot of healing work, yes, the doubt. I was convinced I was making it all up. <laughs> we are so hard on ourselves. Our culture reinforces that all the time. And yet I can tell you, we are so much more than what is here in this the, matter we are far beyond that and it's that divine essence that chose to come here that they love so unconditionally and they will hold you but what makes them very happy as they're showing right now is when you hold yourself and i'm not talking about the moments of triumph it's when you're down in the shadow and in the dumps that you really have to hold yourself as you would a, a powerless little newborn. There is nothing you can do to break that thread to them. 
when you are on the floor crying on your knees, that is when they are there in full light. But we often can't see it because we're internally shaming and judging ourselves. They aren't. So just remember, you would, just as a good parent, would never shame or judge a newborn baby for expressing its needs, they will never shame or not love us for expressing ours. So hold yourself gently and ask for their help. Oh, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. And what a great way to end the show, Book Grove. Thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. It's been such Thank a you. delight. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was That's an honor. Bye-bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.